Welcome to Whiskey Cast, Cast Strength Conversation, featuring news and interviews from the world of whiskey. I'm Mark Gillespie. This is episode number 903 for October 14th, 2021. Coming up in a few minutes. When I think of the the sheer ballsiness, the courage um, of the settlers, men and women, to go and survey this untamed area that was verdant and lots of fresh water uh, and game that, you know, game that was just unbounded in, in, in terms of uh, numbers. And yet the hardships that they endured, I, I just found that absolutely captivating. Next year will mark the 165th anniversary of Daniel Swigert's opening of a small distillery along the Kentucky River name has changed more than a few times over the years, but what we know today as Buffalo Trace Distillery still sits on the same piece of land Swigert picked to make his whiskey. Veteran whiskey writer F. Paul Packholt's new book, Buffalo Barrels and Bourbon, is arguably the definitive history of Buffalo Trace, and since the distillery unveiled its annual antique collection whiskeys the other day, Paul and I spent some time discussing that history. Our conversation is coming up later on Whiskey Cast in Depth. That's just ahead, along with the What I'm Not Tasting This Week department. I'll explain. Whiskey Nobel nominations on Your Voice, Behind the Label, October's Whiskey Club of the Month, and. Remember those casks you sold us back in 2013? Were those water rinsed? It's like, well, when was it exactly? Is it 2013? Yeah, probably. It's like, well, you didn't tell us. <laughs> the news is next on this week's Whiskey Cast. And now, a message from Robin Redbreast. So, in Spain, they call Redbreast Petit Rocco. It's me, but a touch more exotic. Kind of like a Redbreast PX edition. Finished in Pedro Jimenez casks, adding a velvety and decadent dimension. You know, I won't lie. A climate like this makes me wish I was a migratory bird. Proud sponsor of Whiskey Cast. Redbreast. Pass it on. What do Japan and Scotland have in common? You guessed it, whiskey. That's why Dewar's brought these two cultures together in our newest cast series innovation. Introducing Dewar's eight-year Japanese smooth. We took the Dewar's you know and love and finished it in rare Mizunara oak casks for a complex and balanced scotch whiskey like no other. Let's get started with the news. U.S. Trade Representative Catherine Tai and European Union Trade Commissioner Valdis Dombrovskis met Tuesday during the G20 trade conference in Sorrento, Italy. The ongoing dispute over U.S. tariffs on imported steel and aluminum was one of the key areas of discussion. And, of course, that is a key issue for both American whiskey makers and European consumers. The European Union responded to those 2018 Trump administration-era tariffs with a 25% tariff on imports of American whiskeys and other consumer goods, and those tariffs have cut heavily into exports of bourbons and other American whiskeys to Europe. Earlier this year, the EU postponed its scheduled doubling of the whiskey tariff to 50%, while the two sides tried to work out a compromise on the steel and aluminum issue. That postponement is scheduled to end on December 1st. Dombrovskis told Bloomberg News during his recent trip to the U.S. that there is no plan in place for another postponement. Now we are working exactly with this timeline uh, in mind because those tariffs are uh, uh, kicking in uh, automatically. So, But uh, this was a timeline we uh, knew, in a sense, uh, from the very beginning. And both from EU side and U.S. side, we are working with this uh, timeline. So I hope that we'll be able to resolve this dispute. In fact, Dombrovskis told Bloomberg that the actual deadline to avoid the automatic doubling of the tariff should really be viewed as November 1st, since it'll take several weeks to get any deal approved by all 27 EU member nations. No resolution came out of Tuesday's meeting in Italy, 
but the two sides did agree to keep talking. Despite the tariffs, and even with a global pandemic, Kentucky's whiskey industry has reached an all-time record in production. Figures from the state's revenue department show Kentucky distillers filled almost 2.5 million barrels of bourbon during 2020, despite the pandemic, while the state's inventory of maturing whiskey has broken the 10 million barrel mark for the first time on record. As of last January 1st, 10,321,793 barrels of bourbon, to be exact, were aging in rickhouses around Kentucky. And when you add in rye and wheat whiskey, along with other spirits, the total number of barrels comes in at around 10.9 million. That's also a new record, according to Eric Gregory of the Kentucky Distillers Association. Well, it's the biggest since records were kept, and I was talking to Bill Samuels the other day, and I said, Bill, I, I think we're probably safe to say that this is the biggest ever, right? Because even back during you know the heydays of the 50s and 60s, they probably didn't have the production or the aging warehouses to keep that many, in, and he agreed. So even though it's the biggest since records were kept in 1967 starting, um, pretty confident this is probably the biggest, at least since Prohibition. By the way, the state's figures include distilleries like Buffalo Trace and Barton 1792 that are not members of the KDA. That growth is coming at a cost to the industry, though. Kentucky is the only place where aging barrels of whiskey are subject to property taxes every year, and distillers will pay a record $33 million in barrel taxes on that inventory, Most of the tax revenue goes to local and county governments to fund public schools and other services, and that makes it politically difficult to just eliminate the barrel tax. The KDA has been advocating for, oh, decades, uh, you know, ways to eliminate uh, the barrel tax and not only keep us competitive, but invest that capital back into our facilities. But you've got the issue of how do you do that without hurting our local schools, which you know, we would never want to do. Um, So we continue to work with the legislature and try to find solutions to do that uh, and and still keep the local communities whole. One of the solutions you guys have worked on, have used before, was getting a credit against your state income taxes for what your members pay in the barrel taxes. But that only goes so far when uh, the amount that you could claim on a barrel tax credit actually exceeds the corporate income tax, right? That's exactly right. Um, So we got that bill passed in 2014, and it was phased in over five years. um, And it does allow a dollar-for-dollar credit against your corporate income taxes for whatever you pay in payroll taxes. And uh, we actually volunteered in that legislation uh, that uh, the distillers would be required to take that money and reinvest in their Kentucky facilities. So it's, I guess, kind of worked too well. Uh, We've taken that money, we've reinvested, we've grown production, we've added more bottling lines and aging warehouses, and now we're at records and production. So many of the larger distilleries are paying one, two, three times as much in barrel taxes than they are in corporate income taxes. Gregory and his members are working with state lawmakers to come up with a reform plan in time for the next legislative session that starts in January. One other note out of Kentucky It looks like the Stoley Group's plans for a Kentucky Owl distillery in Bardstown are getting back on track. That project was unveiled with a lot of fanfare four years ago next month, but there's been nothing to show for it since then other than a few architects' renderings. Stoley Group has now hired Bardstown Bourbon Company founder David Mandel to lead its real estate unit and spearhead construction of the project in the old stone quarry on the east side of Bardstown. Mandel stepped aside as CEO of Bardstown Bourbon Company a couple of years ago, but remains an investor in the company. He is also the chairman of the Kentucky Bourbon Festival's board of directors. We'll keep an eye on this project as it starts to develop. In other news, decanter number one of Gordon and McPhail's Generations Glenlivet, 80 years old, went on the auction block last Thursday at Sotheby's in Hong Kong. The high bid came from an unidentified European collector at $193,000 U.S. 
It also includes a private whiskey tasting for four in London with Gordon and McPhail's Stephen Rankin, the original barrel head from the cask that held that whiskey for 80 years, and a -a one-of-a-kind signed lithograph of Sir David Ed Jai's original concept design for the decanter and its bespoke oaken case. Proceeds from that auction will benefit the Trees for Life nursery in Scotland and its goal of restoring the Caledonian forest. Now that was on Thursday. The next day, Sotheby's Hong Kong auctioned off the only complete six-bottle collection of the Dalmore Decades single malts, selected by Richard Patterson from casks filled between 1951 and 2000. An unidentified Asian collector placed the winning bid of $1,124,000. Part of the proceeds will be donated to the Victoria and Albert Museum in Dundee, Scotland. Irish whiskey makers are proposing a change to their current regulations in order to return to a more traditional style of Irish whiskey. The current specifications in effect in Ireland, Northern Ireland, and at the European Union level limit the amount of grains in Irish whiskey other than malted or unmalted barley to 5% of a total mash bill. However, historical research led by writer and historian Finan O'Connor shows that distillers often used much higher percentages of oats, wheat, and rye in making their pot still whiskies back in the day. Now the Irish Whiskey Association has proposed to raise that limit to 30% in its proposal to the Irish and UK governments as part of a series of changes to the specs for Irish whiskey. There is one other area in that proposal to keep an eye on. It also suggests restrictions similar to those in place in Scotland and other countries banning the use of numbers on labels and brand names that might confuse consumers into thinking that they're an age statement. The Independent reported over the weekend that if that proposal is adopted, it could force Beckley's Proximo Spirits Unit to change the name of proper number 12 Irish whiskey. The 12 refers to the postal code for founder Connor McGregor's home neighborhood in Dublin 12, but critics have claimed ever since the whiskey hit the market that it suggests a much older age for that whiskey than it actually is. Representatives of Proximo Spirits declined to comment on the proposal this week when we reached out to them. When does a distillery have two different names? Well, that's a question we can answer now. In Lawrenceburg, Indiana, where the venerable distillery that's now owned by MGP's Luxco division has yet another name. Over the years, it's been known as the Rossville Distillery, Seagram's Distillery, LDI, and most recently, MGP of Indiana. It'll keep that name for the bulk whiskey MGP sells to its clients, but the distillery is now adopting a new brand name for its own whiskies. Get used to the Ross and Squibb Distillery, the home of the George Remus Bourbon and Rossville Rye Whiskey brands, just to name a few. Finally, the Distilled Spirits Council held its annual conference last week in Austin, Texas, including its annual awards ceremony. The U.S. Bartenders Guild was honored with the Humanitarian Service Award for its work last year in helping hospitality industry workers with economic hardships caused by the pandemic. James E. Pepper distillery owner Amir P. was named the Dave Pickerel Memorial Craft Member of the Year. Alex Castle was honored with the Impact Award for Emerging Leaders. She is the master distiller at Old Dominic Distillery in Memphis, Tennessee. And Jim Beam's Fred No was named the winner of this year's Lifetime Achievement Award. Congratulations to all. You can keep up with the latest whiskey news all week long at whiskeycast.com. Now for the latest chapter of the Concussion Chronicles. As I mentioned in the last episode, I am still recovering from a concussion after hitting my head in a fall a couple of weeks ago. There are good days and bad days, and I am not back to 100% yet by a long shot. 
So we are going to hold off on the return of the Friday Happy Hour Live webcast until at least next week. Since it's taking me several days to produce the podcast each week, a bit at a time. Thanks again for all of your kind words and messages over the last couple of weeks. I really do appreciate your support. Time now for the Whiskey Cast calendar of events brought to you by Catoctin Creek Distilling. We have some changes to upcoming events because of the pandemic. The Whiskey X in Los Angeles, originally scheduled for this Friday night, has now been postponed until next year. No new date has been set. And the Australian Malt Whiskey Tasting Championship, originally scheduled for later this month in Sydney, has been postponed until next March. Events that are taking place, ASW Distillery in Atlanta has its fifth anniversary celebration coming up this Saturday at the distillery. Congratulations! Saturday is also Sagamore Spirit Distillery's final Whiskey on the Waterfront Party of the Year in Baltimore, Maryland. Death & Company in New York City has an American Single Malt Symposium and tasting this coming Monday night, the 18th. The Mercat Grill in White Craig, Scotland has a Lindoris Abbey tasting and lunch on Tuesday the 19th. Whiskey and Barrel Night is still on for the 21st in Los Angeles. And the Spirit of Toronto Festival kicks off a series of virtual warehouse tastings on the 22nd, starting off with Japan's Chichibu Distillery. Frankfort, Kentucky hosts Bourbon on the Banks next weekend on the 22nd and 23rd. The Whiskey X is in Las Vegas that weekend as well. And Arizona's Whiskey Del Bac Distillery holds the first of its two 10th anniversary parties on the 23rd. This one is in Phoenix. The other is in Tucson on November 13th. And once again, congratulations on the anniversary. We are updating the calendar at WhiskeyCast.com with both in-person and virtual events throughout the week as we get details on new events and changes to existing ones. Remember, in-person events may require you to show proof of vaccination or a negative COVID test in order to attend. Make sure you check ahead of time. The calendar of events is brought to you by Catoctin Creek Distilling makers of the Virginia Rye Whiskey. You'll find their Roundstone Rye at fine whiskey shops in 26 U.S. states, three continents, and online. Visit the new buyvirginiarye.com website for more details. And please drink responsibly. It's been 175 years and Durers continues to stay curious. We're proud to announce the newest addition to the innovative Dewar's 8-year cast finish series of Scotch whiskey, Dewar's Japanese Smooth. Brought to life by our award-winning master blender, Stephanie McLeod, Japanese Smooth is a perfectly balanced 8-year-old Scotch whiskey that puts a pioneering and innovative focus on our aging process. After eight years in Scotland, we blend, age again, then finish this whiskey in cast made from 200-year-old Mizunara oak trees. Rare, sure, but worth it. The Mizunara oak perfectly complements the tasty notes with Dewar's Scotch whiskey. Japanese Smooth is loaded with Dewar's signature honey and floral notes, with the Japanese Mizunara oak adding exotic sweet and spicy flavors. Curious? Try this one in a perfect Japanese highball or on the rocks. Whiskey Cast in Depth is brought to you by Oban and the Classic Malts lineup. Buffalo Trace unveiled this year's antique collection lineup of whiskeys the other day with just four whiskeys instead of the usual five. The Sazerac 18-year-old rye, the Thomas H. Handy Sazerac rye, the William LaRue Weller bourbon, and the Eagle Rare 17-year-old bourbon. Missing? The flagship of the lineup the George T. Stagg Bourbon. According to the distillery, that's because the barrels filled 15 years ago intended for this year's Stagg didn't meet the Stagg taste profile. And with an uncut and unfiltered whiskey from a specific year, there's no way to mask any imperfections. So the Buffalo Trace team decided to just not release a George T. Stagg this year. 
at some distilleries that might be considered unthinkable. Not release a whiskey that's almost guaranteed to sell out no matter what it tastes like and pass up all that revenue? Well, Buffalo Trace has always marched to the beat of a different drummer, and longtime whiskey writer F. Paul Packolt tells the story behind today's Buffalo Trace and the history that leads up to it in his new book, Buffalo Barrels and Bourbon. Paul and I spent some time the other day discussing that story on Zoom. This is unlike the previous books you've written in that it focuses in on really one distillery. Why Buffalo Trace for this book? You know, when Wiley, our publisher Wiley, came to us about, well, now must be about three and a half years ago, Mark. Wow, can't believe it's been that long. And basically, they just said, we want you, we'd really like to do another uh, book with you after American Still Life and Double Scotch. And just come up with something, you know. And so Sue and I, uh, we took about six, seven weeks to kind of think, who would we want to write about this time? We did Chivas and the Glenlivet and then Jim Beam. And I'll be honest, we were very close to doing uh, the history of McAllen and uh, Highland Park. And, um, but I just kept thinking, Buffalo Trace, with all their experiments and all the stuff that they're doing that is really extracurricular and, frankly, very expensive. Um, and I just thought, you know, for the moment, let's, let's, do, let's do Buffalo Trace and see what their history is. Um, and maybe the next one will be uh, – we'll go back to Scotland and do research again. But Buffalo Trace, I think, right now – is emblematic of what's happening with American whiskey, perhaps more than any other place. Because they're, as Harlan Wheatley said, (laughs) uh, they're a big distiller, but they're also kind of a craft distiller at the same time. So they're they're kind of covering both areas. And I thought, uh, because, you know, like you, I mean, I've been, Uh, keenly aware of all the experiments that they've been doing, which I know has cost them millions of dollars. But that that keen sense of curiosity, that just unbridled interest in finding out, (laughs) just really, really, we found that really attractive. And so so we decided on, on Buffalo Trace, uh, Wiley being Wiley just said, okay, that's good. You know, come back with us uh, with 50,000 words uh, in February of 2021 and we'll get it out there. And so that's what happened. Nice to have that kind of freedom, isn't it? Well, I, I have to tell you, uh, Mark, we're so blessed with two fantastic publishers, uh, Ben Bella Books, uh, who did um, The New Kindred Spirits and and Wiley with uh, Buffalo Barrels and Bourbon. We're very, very fortunate. We do not take it for granted because uh, I also know a lot of our peers who have had issues with publishers. I have to tell you, these two are just fantastic. So they're they're a delight to work with. It seems like the Buffalo Trace story has a lot more to tell than, for instance, Highland Park and the McAllen only because there are so many scoundrels and so many personalities and so many mavericks involved in this distillery almost from the beginning, weren't there? Well, I I think part of the the joy for me of doing the research, uh, well, and Sue as well, because we we both did it, um, research for two years and then writing and editing for one year, um, was the discovery of, just as you say, all of these incredible personalities, um, some of whom, you know, were pretty dodgy and, uh, and even, even an iconic character like um, Taylor, uh, you know, E.H. Taylor Jr. He fled the country, didn't he? Had, had his odd proclivities and um, you know, he wasn't great with money. He, He had wonderful ideas in his own way, he was a true visionary. Um, he fought for the Bottled and Bond Act more than anybody else. 
So all of those things wrapped together, including his grandiosity and his inability to control his spending, um, you know, it was just a great story. But I think what I learned, Mark, um, even before getting into the whiskey part, when we were doing the research, it uh, what two years, yeah, two and three years ago, after we signed the contract, I was trying to think of how am I going to start this book? Now, do I just start, you know, with with the, this unbelievable line, this pedigree uh, line of of wonderful distillers, or do I start from the place, the actual place on Earth where the distillery is? And as I was doing more research, it, it became apparent to me that this particular place on the, the Serpentine Kentucky River, which has very few low spots. I mean, if anybody who knows the Kentucky River knows, it largely has these huge walls, you know, some hundreds of feet tall on, on either side. But it was this one place where the buffalo or, well, really bison, um, just trampled for millennia to get across, to go to the greener pastures of Indiana and southern Ohio. And I just thought, this is such a great story. And then how all of the settlers and how the, the surveyors who, when I think of how fortunate we are today with all these modern conveniences and luxuries that we all share, or many of us share. Unfortunately, a lot of people in our world still don't. But when I think of the the sheer ballsiness, the courage um, of the settlers, men and women, to go and survey this untamed area that was verdant and lots of fresh water uh, and game that, you know, game that was just unbounded in, in, in terms of uh, numbers, and yet the hardships that they endured, I, I just found that absolutely captivating. And so that's why the, the first three or four chapters of the book have nothing to do with Buffalo Trace, have nothing to do with whiskey making. It just has all to do with the incredible, intrepid stories of these people who settled the Ohio River Valley and that one particular spot. But they're the ones who made that distillery possible. Absolutely. Most people don't remember the fact that Leestown was the original town there. It wasn't yeah. Frankfurt. It was Leestown. That's, right. That's right. But Leestown was always this tricky location just because as more Euro-Americans were coming in and settling and surveying and plotting out land, um, you know, it really pissed off the Native Americans because Northern Kentucky, the, the entire Southern Indiana, Southern Ohio, basically the bluegrass of Kentucky, was their favorite hunting ground. There weren't actually Native Americans who lived in Northern, what's now Northern Kentucky, but that was their hunting ground. So with all of these strangers suddenly coming in, uh, just, you know, putting up log cabins, lean-tos, uh, planting acres of corn. Um, so it was restricting the area for game. And so, you know, the Native Americans understandably got pissed off. And, yeah. and so there was a lot of, a lot of fighting. Uh, the French and Indian War, which was basically the English and French fighting. Uh, of course, the Revolutionary War. Um, you know, it, it was a really difficult time for the Native Americans. And I felt that it was really important to tell that story as well. Uh, and also the, the devastation that was the, the massive genocide of American bison. I felt that story had to be told first before I even wanted to scratch the surface on the distilling aspect, because all of those things, just as you said, all of those things contributed to that particular spot and why that spot was so advantageous to establish Lee's town. And then in 1857, uh, Swigert, who owned the, the land, Daniel Swigert, 
established the first small distillery there. And look what's happened <laughs> since 1857. It's a, it's a pretty great saga. It really is. And you can't tell that saga without also addressing the other moral yeah. scandal of the time in slavery in that really exactly. the distillery yeah. there is one of the few still active in Kentucky that was active back before the Civil War. That's right. And had slaves working there. And some of the buildings on the campus were built by slaves that still exist today. Exactly true. Exactly true. And that's that's in part why I go through the lineage of the social elite of North Central and Western Kentucky. There were six, seven, eight families that were um, considered the cultural elite. And they were very conservative in nature. They basically... As I say in the book, it was pretty much a business operation because they'd help each other business-wise. Um, and again, keeping this was still in many ways the frontier. Even looking back on 1860, 1861, when the, when the first echoes of the Civil War were really beginning to get louder and louder, there was still a lot of frontier. So I understand how families would stick together, certainly, and promote their own and uh, some intermarriage with cousins. And, but they were basically very, very conservative people who believed in the slave trade, who believed in the indentured service of other human beings. And um, to me, that's, that's a really important part of the book. In one chapter, I discuss that, uh, certainly tying it in with the Civil War and, and really what the Civil War was all about. And, you know, historians can say what they want. And I, and, uh, I love David McCulloch, a uh, great historian of our generation, um, his take on it, which is, yeah, there are excuses that, well, you know, the, it, the Civil War was really all about commerce and the rich industrial North and the agricultural South. No, it wasn't. No. <laughs> that, that's, that's just bullshit. The Civil War was all about one thing, and it was indentured servitude of other human beings. Let's emphasize that Buffalo Trace, while they cooperated with you on this and opened up the archives mm -hmm. and worked with you, they had no say in the content of this book. Do you think they've done a good job of trying to mitigate some of that history, considering, for instance, that Colonel E.H. Taylor owned slaves, and we have whiskeys named after him today, things like that. Uh, do you think they've done a good job of trying to, if not offer reparations for the past, at least trying to acknowledge a role in it? I, I, I actually do. I think they have not hidden from the fact uh, that part of their history during that period in particular um, was tainted by that particular political and socioeconomic belief. Uh, so, you know, and but then comes along George T. Stagg, who took over the distillery from E.H. Taylor, and he was a firm abolitionist. I mean, he, he, he actually fought through the entire Civil War, all four years, in uh, one of the most illustrious divisions of the uh, Union Army of all, uh, the, one of the Kentucky, I think it was Kentucky 21st or something, but they were remarkably uh, disciplined and fantastically uh, successful soldiers. So I think having, it, it was kind of interesting because having George T. Stagg take over the distillery, buying it basically from, from E.H. and Fanny uh, Taylor. Um, it was kind of a passing of a torch of politically and socioeconomically also and culturally that he was from Kentucky originally, Stag, but he moved to St. Louis after the war. Uh, but as I say, he was a firm, fervent abolitionist and, um, uh, and a war hero. So the fact that he and E.H. Taylor never got along, they just fought constantly. It wasn't necessarily about that. It was just they were, they were chalk and cheese in personalities. 
when Taylor finally said, okay, I'm out of here, that's it. And, and he ended up uh, uh, going in with his sons to create old Taylor distillery. Um, having George T. Stagg as this abolitionist and someone who was this hero for treating humans, everybody the same, no matter what, it was kind of a passing of the torch. It was a, it was almost like saying, okay, that was the past. It's not going to be like that anymore. So Stagg takes over and continues <laughs> all of the, the majestic triumphs that E.H. Taylor achieved. And to some degree, I think even uh, did Taylor a tremendous good by making Taylor's legacy really all about whiskey and what he did to transform and basically modernize the Kentucky distilling scenario. I mean, Taylor, for all of his faults, had some incredible visionary qualities, and he had the wherewithal to make them happen by creating, at the time, what was considered the best whiskey in Kentucky by a long, long way. I mean, before then, Old Crow was considered the standard. But boy, once, uh, once Taylor got going with uh, the OFC distillery, his whiskeys were fantastic. I, I, would, I would just love to have a taste of one of those, Mark. I yeah. know I'll never be able to. You and me um, both. But it, I, I'm sure it would be a real eye-opening experience if it were still good and not too oxygenated. Let's talk about some of the other personalities, the unique personalities that have been around this place over the last uh, couple hundred years. you got to start with, for instance, James Wilkinson. The road's named after him that Buffalo Trace is on, Wilkinson Parkway. He was the original scoundrel. That's right. Oh, he was, he was about as low you can get on the evolutionary scale, I think, because he was... He was a guy who actually, uh, of course, all Americans who know history are aware of the name Benedict Arnold as the, your, your, quintessential, <laughs> your quintessential traitor. So James Wilkinson was his cohort for a while. So he was learning at the feet of a master in terms of how to be uh, uh, a master of skullduggery and duplicitous behavior. And his career absolutely showed all of those things because he was just a son of a gun. And, um, you know, you couldn't trust him as far as you could throw him. And, and yet somehow, Mark, as many times as he was thrown out of the U.S. Army, then somebody else would hire him back. So, so he was kind of this interesting character in that he was just horrible out for himself to make a fortune at everybody else's expense. And yet he had this charm. He had this ability to talk his way into uh, these high levels of, of notor, or, or really of degree in the army. You know, he was a, he was a brigadier general when he was 20, you know, to, to the, to the, absolute horror of all the more qualified older officers uh, at the time, but he was something else. So after a lot of his uh, career had gone south just because of such a poor reputation, he decided to move from the East uh, States and to move to the bluegrass of Kentucky. And he basically founded Frankfurt and um, Lee's town, as, as we alluded to earlier, preceded Frankfurt by quite a long way. But this guy, Wilkinson, was such a cunning, slippery character that anything that the people of Lee's town would do commercially, you know, like build a ferry, uh, and then Wilkinson, just down the river, would build a bigger and faster ferry. <laughs> Lee's town never had a post office. Frankfurt got a post office. When Kentucky became a state in 1792, they needed a capital. So E.H. Taylor was, was pushing Lee's town. Other people were pushing Harrodsburg. Um, 
Wilkinson had all the juice. Who knows who he paid off? But Frankfurt became, even though it wasn't necessarily the best spot, Frankfurt became the capital of Kentucky because of him. And we should at least give him credit for not naming the town after himself. <laughs> That's true. It's really true. Actually, he named it after a surveyor who was killed in an Indian attack uh, while he was surveying. And he was at a salt flat and uh, his name was Ford. And that particular area of the river, they called Frank's Ford because you could get across at that point also, which is like a mile and a half up from the great Buffalo Trace. But uh, no, Wilkinson was just a piece of work. And it made me laugh, to be honest, Mark, when, when I was writing that chapter, because I could have gone on for a long time on, on Wilkinson uh, and his adventures. I mean, it was, he was such a nefarious son of a gun. Teddy Roosevelt and all these historians had these horrible things to say about him. Actually, there's a wonderful book about Wilkinson, and I forget what it is. It's here in my library somewhere. Um, and I, I would just be howling with laughter someone just listening to this guy and, and all of the terrible things he would do with totally no care about any ramifications. I mean, he, he gave up his American citizenship and became a citizen of Spain just so he could double deal between the two countries. <laughs> and then, then, Mark, he had the audacity to demand a pension <laughs> from the king of Spain, and the king gave it to him. So, I mean, talk about a, a master swindler and a sleight-of-hand artist. This guy was amazing. And that's just part of the legacy, but it goes to <laughs> the honest people, folks like Colonel Albert Blanton. Oh, man. Who succeeded George T. Stagg, although he didn't own the place. Uh, no. He was working for Lou Rosensteel, but uh, Blanton, by all accounts, was every bit the gentleman that Stagg was, right? You know, and, and I think testimony to that was when Albert Bacon Blanton passed away, that the industry, the entire Kentucky distilling industry was just devastated. He was just, uh, in, in the truest sense, a Kentucky gentleman and a phenomenal distiller. Uh, just, I think that the best story about Blanton, well, there are many. Um, the two that stand out to me are during the flood of 1937, which was catastrophic. And, and I go into the flood just from the meteorological aspect because it was such a, a once in a thousand years situation where the entire Ohio River Valley was just inundated for hundreds and hundreds of miles. In January of 1937, it didn't stop raining for 20 days. So because the, the Ohio River Valley is just this incredible system, a highway system of rivers, when the Ohio floods, it backs up everybody, including, in this case, uh, the 200-plus mile long northwest flowing Kentucky River. And it inundated Buffalo Trace Distillery. Well, at that time, it was George uh, T. Stagg Distillery. But while everybody else left all her other distilleries, Blanton, with a small crew of cohorts, stayed. And when other distilleries couldn't get up and running again for weeks, sometimes months, George T. Stagg was up and running again in 48 hours because of Albert Blanton and his cohorts, his team, his guys who, uh, who hung out and stayed and cleaned up, kept the machinery working and protected the barrels in the warehouse. It's a phenomenal story, I think, of incredible courage. Um, and that, of course, uh, Louis Rosenstiel at the time thought, this guy walks on whiskey. You know, he's a hero. Uh, he saved the distillery, frankly. And the other story I think about uh, Lanton that I like so much is he realized that during Prohibition, 
they needed a change of ownership. And so he actually arranged the deal himself between Rosensteel, which at that point was Shenley Products, and the owners at the time, who was this one, two guys out of New York State, one of them, Walter P. Duffy, who was one of the biggest, another con artist. And that's a wonderful chapter, too. But Albert Blanton, you know, no business degree, not just, just a guy who was a great distiller, arranged this deal and ended up where it ended up really, I think, saving George T. Stagg because uh, Louis Rosensteel himself was uh, an amazing character. But he was smart enough to see that Blanton was just an incredibly upright guy who his staff just would do anything for him. And, you know, how many, how many leaders do you ever find like that where, you know, you know, during the, the biggest flood in a thousand years, your crew is staying to help you. So Rosensteel was no fool. And so he really left the distillery to Blanton and said, go do your thing. But I want you to continue making the best whiskey that's made in Kentucky. And Blanton did. And Blanton basically ran all of Rosensteel's other distilleries around Kentucky too, right? Amazing. I don't know how he did it when, when you think. You know, I mean, they didn't have the technology that we have today where, yeah, one guy could run several operations and, and, you know, just from his office. But this, you know, he was having to travel to different five different distilleries at one point. And, uh, of course, George T. Stagg was was his home and and his baby. Uh, So Rosenstiel gave him, he just put on his plate, which became a platter, I think, the responsibility for five distilleries at one time, which, I mean, you and I, we've been around distilleries a lot. We know what a difficult job it is just to run one. Yeah. Blanton successfully ran five, six at one time. Amazing guy. Just an amazing guy. Let's fast forward through the years with folks like uh, Elmer T. Lee and Gary Gayhart and some of the legends who followed Blanton. Mm-hmm. We've never really talked much about how the Goldring family of Sazerac fame came to acquire the place back in the late 90s. How did that happen? Actually, it was uh, 97 that they bought um, the whiskeys. They bought whiskeys, and it just so happened there was a distillery (laughs) involved, too. So Bill Goldring's father thought, "Eh, yeah, this this is a good deal. But what, what made me laugh, I talked to Bill Goldring a few weeks ago about the book, and Bill said to me, you know, my father said to me many years ago, because Bill had worked for uh, Seagram's here in New York, then went back to New Orleans to work with his dad, run the business uh, of Sazerac. And Bill's dad said to him at some point, I think this must have been in the probably the 60s, he said, just stay away from bourbon. (laughs) Because at the time, bourbon was kind of in the doldrums. And Bill's father was very wary of being stuck with what he called a lake of bourbon. So he said, he said to Bill, his son, just stay away from bourbon. I don't think you should get involved. So what does Bill do? Uh, He you know, purchases the George T. Stagg Distillery and their brands. And, uh, and then in 1999, renames it Buffalo Trace to honor that place. And look what's happened today. <laughs> it's pretty remarkable. When we started talking, you mentioned the fact that they have all these experiments going that cost millions of dollars and all that. And you got to think that a lot of that would not be possible if it weren't for the fact that the Goldring family owns this place. It's a privately held company. They don't have to answer to Wall Street. Mm. And they can afford to invest in stuff for the future without having to answer to all the stockbrokers and analysts out there who see it as a drag on earnings when you actually try to do something creative. I, I think you hit the nail right on the head, Mark. Um, they have been able to, I mean, once... Bill Goldring enticed Mark Brown to come back to Sazerac. 
right when, I think it was 1996, 1997, after Mark had been with Brown Foreman for several years. Um, Mark Brown is very good at pivoting quickly in times when, as you say, another company, and they're all good companies, let's face it, Beam Suntry, Brown Foreman, uh, Diageo, um, they're all really solid companies, make fantastic stuff. But they can't pivot necessarily as quickly as a family-owned company like Heaven Hill, like Buffalo Trace, because they don't have to answer to the stockholders, just as you say. So I think it gives them a margin of freedom that corporate-owned companies, stockholder companies, just don't have. That kind of ability to say, like Mark Brown will say to Harlan Wheatley, well, why don't we build a small warehouse that will have four different parts just for the hell of it to see how humidity affects whiskey, the aging of whiskey, how airflow maybe or maybe not affects maturation. And let's call it Warehouse X. And Harlan has the freedom and the financial resource to be able to do something like that. Other companies probably wouldn't be able to do that. Now, Oh, most other distillers, if they tried to pitch that, if they tried to go up the ladder with that, they'd get slapped back down in a New York minute. But in this case, it came from the top down. I would think so. You know, and I'm sure at some point, and I mentioned this in the book, I'm sure at some point, some of the other companies, some of Buffalo Trace's competitors might try, this is kind of a P.T. Barnum thing, all this experimentation stuff. You know, I mean, how much of it are they really learning? My sense, after interviewing Harlan, Mark, um, Drew Mayville, um, uh, the guys who are really involved in, in the experimentation, I tend to think that they do learn quite a bit. Now, are the findings, are the conclusions that they're coming to from the single oak project, from the planting different strains of corn, uh, Warehouse X, which tries all these atmospheric uh, uh, tests and, and examinations of how whiskey matures, are they getting enough information from all of that and from that expenditure to make whiskey better in the coming years? I don't know. Yeah, I honestly don't know. Do I think they believe it's worth it? Hands down, absolutely. I don't think for a minute after talking to them extensively that they would do it any other way. I I think that their, their level of curiosity about what makes whiskey work um, and is there possibly some sort of a combination of environmental situations, of base materials, of wood? Um, is there some sort of formula that can make the ultimate whiskey? I think that's what it's all about. Will it ever happen? I don't think so, to be honest. Do I love them for trying? Yeah, I have to admit I do. Um, Somebody's got to do it. I think what they do is extraordinary. Um, some of it is kind of crazy. and I. But I just think, you know, probably people looked at Thomas Edison and Alexander Graham Bell and thought, yeah, these guys are nuts. You know, what, what are they trying to do? You know, talk to somebody who's 400 miles. Yeah, it's impossible. But you got to love the fact that they were curious enough to to give it a shot. And the thing is, most of the other distilling companies do stuff that's very similar. They just don't talk about it. Well, you know, I actually I think I think that's kind of the, the, the point here that I think in a way, Mark Brown and Harlan have kind of led the way for this path. They've kind of trailblazed the experimentation path, I think, for the rest of the industry. 
But I think now a lot of craft distillers are looking at different things to do that maybe seem really off the wall. Um, or somebody like Elmer T. Lee would be going, oh my God, that's crazy. They can't do that. But I think because Buffalo Trace kind of led the way on this, it has started a parade. And, and I agree with you. I actually think there are other companies, big companies that are doing things. They're just not as publicly open about it as, as Mark and Harlan and Amy Presky are about what they're doing. Um, so, you know, I applaud Buffalo Trace for what they do. I don't know if they're ever going to find the holy grail of American whiskey. And if they don't, I think that's okay because what they're doing in the meantime, and frankly, what all the whiskey distillers in America are doing right now, craft, middle-sized, monster companies, I think what they're all doing right now, look at the time you and I live in, Mark. This is, this is an unprecedented moment of glorious adventure, I think. Uh, the fact that we're able to taste, try all these different things, all the different Weller expressions, all the different Elijah Craig expressions, all the different um, old Fitzgerald expressions, the Booker's. We're in this wonderful cradle of creativity right now that has never been seen before. And, you know, I, I think what's happening in American distilling is the uh, for whiskey producers is the envy of the world right now. You know, I'm talking about the, the Irish distillers. I'm talking about Scotland. I'm talking about Taiwan. I'm talking about Japan. I think what's happening right here, right now, is leading the world. I think it's just an amazing time we live in. F. Paul Packholtz, Buffalo Barrels and Bourbon is available through your local bookseller and online. I've received samples of the four whiskeys in this year's antique collection from Buffalo Trace. But since I am not yet cleared medically to resume tasting whiskeys, I will post my tasting notes for them as soon as I can at the WhiskeyCast website. That's WhiskeyCast In-Depth, brought to you by Oban. Every sip of Oban is like a postcard from Scotland. Whether it's the classic Oban 14-year-old, the 18-year-old, Oban Little Bay, or the Distiller's Edition, every drop comes from the coastal town of Oban and a distillery just 206 steps away from the sea. It's one of Scotland's smallest distilleries. Just seven people make whiskey the same way their predecessors have since 1794. Find out more at obanwhiskey.com. The What I'm Not Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Sagamore Spirit. And as I mentioned, I am not able to taste any whiskeys right now while I'm recovering from my concussion. So I don't have any new tasting notes to share this week. But it is a chance to share some tasting notes from a recent tasting of old whiskeys I did with the folks from Whiskey Auctioneer a while back, before their latest auction of rare vintage American whiskeys. For instance, one of those whiskeys was a 1984 bottling of eight-year-old wild turkey bourbon. Of course, it was at Jimmy Russell's preferred strength of 50.5% ABV, or 101 proof. The nose, classic wild turkey with lots of woody character, oak sugars, and a hint of tannins, along with caramel, honey, baking spices, and hints of apples and orange peel. The taste had a great robust spiciness with notes of clove, black pepper, and cardamom, balanced by baked apples, candied orange slices, roasted nuts, and touches of figs and raisins. The finish was long and equally complex. If I had to compare it to today's whiskeys, I'd give this 1984 wild turkey 8-year-old bourbon a 93. Today, what used to be known as Rebel Yell is just known as Rebel Whiskey, but back in the day it was distilled at the legendary Stitzel Weller Distillery in Louisville. We tasted a 1990 release that was bottled at 40% ABV. The nose had notes of chocolate, mint, caramel, 
dried fruits, brown sugar, and peach cobbler. The taste was dry, crisp, and sweet, with touches of milk chocolate, caramel candy, and hints of nuttiness, lemon cream, and oak. The finish had spices that built up slowly to a gentle burst of flavor, along with lingering touches of chocolate and nuts. Let's finish up, though, with a whiskey distilled in 1917, just before Prohibition, from the long-gone Hammond Distillery in Indiana. The old Van de Grift bottled in bond whiskey was released in 1934 at, of course, 50% ABV. After 17 years, the nose had a lot of oak tannins, but also had sweeter notes of butterscotch, brown sugar, and a hint of caramel. The taste was spicy with black pepper and chili powder notes, along with oak tannins, red apples, and hints of caramel and brown sugar. The finish? Long and spicy. No score on this one. While it was clearly still holding up after nearly 80 years in a bottle, it's just not fair to judge a whiskey from that period against today's whiskeys. I'll have new tasting notes as soon as I can, but until then, you'll find my searchable list of tasting notes for more than 3,200 different whiskeys at whiskeycast.com. This week's tasting notes are brought to you by Sagamore Spirit Rye Whiskey. They're reviving the tradition of Maryland-style rye at their Baltimore farm and waterfront distillery. In-person tastings are available once again at the distillery in Baltimore, but you'll also find a variety of virtual tours, tastings, and other experiences at the Sagamore Spirit website. They're offering WhiskeyCast listeners a free virtual guided tasting. Purchase bottles at your local retailer, and a Sagamore Spirit teammate will guide you through each one. Visit sagamorespirit.com and use the code WHISKEYCAST, all one word, to access the tastings. Please drink responsibly. And now, a message from Robin Redbreast. Small batch. How would you describe it? It's like an Irishman's understanding of baseball. Extremely limited. Proud sponsor of Whiskey Cast. Redbreast. Pass it on. I wanted to thank the members of Club 101 in Quebec for inviting me to join them the other night for a virtual American whiskey tasting. They tasted. I talked. Club 101 was our whiskey club of the month earlier this year. Now it's time to pick a new winner for October. Congratulations to the South Coast Whiskey Society of Massachusetts. Amy Milano sent the email nominating her club, which she describes as a new club, but 175 members strong on the south coast of Massachusetts. Thanks, Amy. We'll be sending you two dozen whiskey cast Glencairn glasses to use at your future club tastings. Now, if you're in a whiskey club and would like to nominate your club for next month, it's simple. Just do like Amy did and use the contact form at whiskeycast.com to get in touch with us. Tell us a bit about your club. If you have a website or a social media presence, we'll be glad to add a link on the Whiskey Clubs page at the WhiskeyCast website so other like-minded whiskey lovers can find you. Once again, congratulations to the South Coast Whiskey Society, October's Whiskey Club of the Month. And thanks to Glencairn Crystal for helping us honor whiskey clubs all over the world. Let's open up the inbox now for your voice. With the Nobel Prizes being awarded over the last week or so, I thought it might be fun to see who you would nominate for the fictional Nobel Prize in Whiskey. And we got a lot of responses on Twitter. Scott Rogers tweeted this, The Nobels tend to reward work done a decade or more previously, so who did anything deserving of a whiskey Nobel in 2008 to 2012, or more like the literature approach of lifetime achievement? In the delayed reward spirit, I nominate Stephanie McLeod. The distillate for the really interesting finished blends Dewar's has on the market now was being laid down about a decade ago bringing some of the best innovations in single malts to affordable blends. Patrick Rafter of the Paris, Texas Whiskey Bar in Kilkenny, Ireland tweeted, For a lifetime achievement, 
it would have to be Barry Crockett of Middleton Distillery, in my opinion, without his foresight to lay down so much whiskey when Irish whiskey was on its knees, I dread to think where Irish whiskey would be today. And Tony Thompson tweeted, Surely Fanon O'Connor should be considered for his continued work in reviving historic Irish pot still whiskey mash bills. From B.J. May, I might look at Todd Leopold for resurrecting a beautiful lost method with the three-chamber rye, or perhaps a Lifetime Achievement Award to John Campbell. And from Graham Fraser, for his commitment to single malt and blended whiskey, in a career spanning many decades, and in retirement, his continued promotion of whiskey writing new books, I'd nominate Dr. Nick Morgan. Just to name a few people, we had nominations for Rachel Berry, Bill Lumsden, Andy Watts, Bill Lark, and several for the late Dr. Jim Swan, though, in keeping with the rules of the Norwegian Nobel Committee, nominees must be living to be considered. We also had a few humorous ones as well, including this one from Joseph Trotter. The Nobel Prize for Whiskey Literature is for whoever managed to convince people that any release of 30,000 bottles is small batch. Well played, Joseph. If you'd like to suggest a nomination, or if there is something else you'd like to share with whiskey lovers around the world, you can always find us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at WhiskeyCast, or just email us, comments at WhiskeyCast.com. Let's close out the show now with Behind the Label, our look at the history, science, and people who make whiskey unique. It's brought to you by Writer's Tears. Last time around, I explained the concept behind sherry-seasoned casks, and this week, here's a question for you. When is a first-fill bourbon cask not really a first-fill bourbon cask? Thousands of so-called first-fill bourbon casks make their way to other whiskey makers around the world after they've been used that one time for maturing bourbon. But some of those barrels may be a little less, quote, first fill than others. That's according to John Glazer of Compass Box, who found that some of the first fill bourbon casks he bought years ago were not delivering the results he expected from the new make spirit he had filled into them, because the barrels had been rinsed with water after they'd been used for bourbon. Here's how John explained it on a Zoom call with whiskey writers the other day. I've always loved using first fill American oak barrels, former bourbon barrels or Tennessee whiskey barrels for aging compass box whiskeys because it gives this lovely sweetness and vanilla character and hints of coconut and all this, this sort of thing. And a lot of our whiskeys over the years, Asyla being a great example, Hedonism another, are made entirely or were made entirely from whiskeys aged in first fill American oak barrels. So love that character. But when they started water rinsing barrels, what they were doing is this, they dumped the barrels for bubbling, fill them with water. Um, different, there are diff different distilleries use different techniques, but a typical way would fill it with water, roll it around, leave it, uh, put, it put it on a rack for a couple of days, and then dump out the water, and then send that cask off to Scotland or wherever in the world. And in doing so, what they've done is they've enabled themselves to extract just about as much whiskey, as much alcohol as you can from that wood through that water. What you dump, end up dumping is like very low alcohol, lightly alcoholic water. And they would then use that water for diluting their whiskeys before bottling, bringing them down to bottling strength. So saving money they're actually you know they're, they're, the diluting water brings alcohol as well here you know maximizing their potential to get all the alcohol out of those casks great smart right you sure you know. um now what happens when you send those casks to scotland so they aren't the ordinary casks that for many decades american whiskey distillers have been sending to scotland and, 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 and allowing us to get that lovely sweet vanilla laced first fill cask style now we're getting something different and it took us several years after, from 2013 of sampling the whiskeys we've been putting into these casks to realize, wait a minute, we're not getting that first fill character that we expected 
I remember having this phone call with a very well-known uh, American bourbon <laughs> distiller and saying, hey, remember those casks you sold us back in 2013? Were those water rinsed? It's like, well, when was it exactly? 2013? Yeah, probably. It's like, well, you didn't tell us. <laughs> and so that's not, oh, that's not a bad thing necessarily. Oh, I mean, I, I, if I was them, I would have told you if I'm changing the character. But maybe, maybe they didn't know that it was going to change the character of the casks. And from the big distillers, because I've talked to this big distillers about this over the last many years, several years, some of them don't really care or mind. They don't, they're not bothered by it. Um, but the character is definitely different. How is it different? So as opposed to getting that lovely, what I talked about, the sweet vanilla laced uh, first fill style, now what we're getting is a more subtle vanilla character, a more subtle oak influence. And what it's allowing to happen is for the spirit character, that is the inherent distillery character of that malt whiskey or grain whiskey that was put in that cask, actually kind of be the star. It's not like what you get with a hogshead um, a, a used hogshead, um, that's actually a little more denuded of character than what we get with these uh, water rinse casts. So you're getting a lovely, uh, not as much of a sweetness, but a sweetness and just t- tinged with vanilla character and really allowing the spirit character to sing. Glazer would not name the source of those water rinsed casks. And it is not clear whether this has become standard practice at other bourbon distilleries. Sweating barrels by putting a couple of gallons of water in them and then letting them sit in the sun for a few days is a time-honored Kentucky tradition for extracting whiskey that has soaked into the wood. But, well, it was always done informally, if you get my drift. Jim Bean came up with a more efficient method using steam to extract the whiskey soaked into wood for its Devil's Cut edition, which was first released in 2011, a couple of years before the time period that John Glazer mentioned. But this might just lead to a bit more transparency in the barrel sales business once word gets around. After all, what is to stop a whiskey company that owns distilleries in, say, both Kentucky and Scotland from separating out its used bourbon barrels into two groups? One group that gets water rinsed to be sold on to other users while keeping those unrinsed first fill barrels to use at its own distilleries, and keeping all of that extra flavor in the corporate family. Right now, that is just a conspiracy theory, but keep your eyes open. If you have something you'd like to see us look at on an upcoming episode, just use the contact form at whiskeycast.com to get in touch with us. Behind the Label is brought to you by Writer's Tears. Writer's Tears Copper Pot, a rare style of Irish whiskey with a creative twist. A unique, triple distilled blend of single pot still and single malt premium Irish whiskies. Writer's Tears Copper Pot. Do you dare to be creative? That's all for this edition of Whiskey Cast. You'll find links for the stories in this episode in our show notes at whiskeycast.com. That's also where you'll find the latest whiskey news, my tasting notes, the calendar of events, the whiskey photo of the week, and of course, a complete archive of all of our past episodes going all the way back to 2005. Get in touch with us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at WhiskeyCast, the email address, comments at WhiskeyCast.com. Just like the end of this Whiskey Cast episode, Dewar's Scotch Whiskey always makes for a smooth finish. Like our newly released Dewar's Japanese Smooth, aged for eight years in Scotland, blended then aged again before being finished for up to six months in Mizunar Oak Cast made from 200-year-old Japanese water oak trees. These unique casts layer distinct dry and spicy flavors to the whiskey, with aromas reminiscent of sandalwood and incense. Keep an eye out for a bottle of Dewar's Japanese Smooth at a store near you. And now, a message from Robin Redbreast. Ever go out drinking with a peacock? <laughs> Always the same. A few too many, tail feathers come out, drinks get knocked over, bartender's not happy, night's over before it started. All I'm saying is, don't be the peacock in your group. Proud sponsor of Whiskey Cast, Redbreast. Pass it on. 
Whiskey Cast is a production of Cask Strength Media, copyright 2021, and comes to you from the charming, yet regrettably dry town of Haddonfield, New Jersey. I'm Mark Gillespie, reminding you that when you drink, please drink responsibly. Thanks for listening, and please stay safe. Don't bump your head like I did.